You can turn in your King James Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I have a very important study today, uh, one that the Lord has laid on my heart. Um, I've had to learn some difficult lessons about this, and um, I'm going to be talking about some very important uh, things that I've learned in this study. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, very familiar portion of scripture that I've gone over many times, and we're going to hit it one more time because it's extremely important. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Hmm. Verse 9 is true for anybody. Okay. Verse 10 is as well, the first part of it. But then you get into the thing of the saved there, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And verse 11 is all for a saved man. Verse 11 does not apply to the lost world out there. Um, very deep, profound things in those three verses of Scripture there. A man of God is supposed to flee the uh, love of money, the financial world, they that will be rich, all the different ways that you can make a huge amount of money. And um, I've been studying the financial world. I've been putting a lot of time into that studying things and I mean when I, I had a business accounting class in high school and I absolutely hated it and we were uh, trying to find ways to just mess around and you know goof off and whatever else and uh, just I couldn't stand the class and the, the teacher was this big overweight morbidly obese guy and, and just arrogant and he'd always call us children you know and just <laughs> hated it well you know, I've made a lot of financial mistakes down through the years because of not really paying attention to the financial things, but also not really caring as a high school student. And uh, I didn't know what a stock or a bond was or what's how do you invest money or, you know, what's precious metals or, you know, I had no idea about any of that stuff. So I've been trying to really learn that stuff and um, just even in learning it. There are many foolish and hurtful lusts which can come in and start to drown you in perdition, start to mess you up, um, drown men in destruction and perdition. Um, you can get really messed up quickly with all the financial stuff out there. I'm going to be talking about some things. Uh, thankfully, I didn't you know, completely fall off the deep end, but I was really getting out of fellowship with the Lord. Um, I have been just, I'll talk about it throughout the study. It's, uh, I'm back now with the Lord. I've been uh, listening to a lot more preaching instead of economic type of stuff. And um, it's really been good. I feel a lot more peace. feel my relationship with the Lord is a lot stronger now. It's not that it was bad or anything else or, you know, I was really messed up or something. No, it just was not what it should have been. Go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4 verses 10 through 13. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Um, I have learned, <laughs> uh, there, talks about, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be, to be content. Verse 11, and you say, well, yeah, you know, you learn the truth of the scriptures and then you're, you're set. Um, that's the shocking part about salvation and in particular when you get into ministry. Uh, 
God, for some very odd reason, um, does not just sanctify everything in your life completely at salvation. He doesn't just, you know, wave his hand and say, be healed or something, you know, and boom, and everything, all your sins just go, and they're all gone. It'd be nice if he did. You know, people say, I teach sinless perfection. I wish I could teach sinless perfection. <laughs> it would be really nice if there was some way the Lord could just save you, and then, boom, you just don't mess up anymore, and you don't ever sin anymore. I've never taught that. Um, even though, like I said, I wish I could have. I wish it was true. Uh, you, you'll sin, and you'll mess up. And when you learn something as a preacher, a lot of times it comes from many years of struggle. And just many years when, you know, you'll get 10, 15, 20 years saved and doing things for the Lord and whatever else, and all of a sudden you'll come under conviction about something. And, Lord, I didn't know this was displeasing in your sight. I had no idea. I mean, right there, it's clear in the Bible. I, I'm sorry. I, I had no idea. Lord, yeah, it's, yeah, it's okay. Just, you know, get it cleaned up right now. Well, yes, sir. Yeah, of course. Yes, I'll, I'll get rid of that in my life. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> the Lord sanctifies in stages. And you always have to remember that. Um, a lot of early young Christians will get frustrated because they see some older Christian and they're the super sanctified warrior and they think, well, I should be that as well in my first month of being saved. It doesn't work that way. Um, there are some things you will learn. And I don't just mean learning from the scriptures. You will learn it from years and years of trial and error. Um, you see, this book and the religion this book presents could be just like any other religion out there. I've, you try Islam or you try Buddhism or you try whatever, but the way that the Lord, um, the way the Lord proves this book to you is you will live this book. And it's not just, well, I live by the book. No, no. You will actually have things that happen to people in here happen in your life. And you'll start to have those experiences. And you'll think, well, this is exactly what happened to Paul that one time. That's what they said to the Lord. That person there, I was trying to witness to him, and they, they said the same thing to me. And Wow. Why? We're supposed to have fellowship with Jesus' sufferings. We have fellowship because we go through the same things that he went through. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Have you had uh, some of that happen in your life? I have in mine. Yeah. Uh, family members turning against you. The Bible says it would happen. And it happens. And there are so many things that there's just there's no explanation for you. Just look and you say, well, I never expected that I would go through this. I didn't try to go through it. It's not that I'm trying to make things happen in my life so I can say I line up with the book. Not at all. Uh, but there will be things that will come into your life and it will happen and it will shock you because it will be just like people go through in there. I remember I, you know, back when I was a Christian as a younger man and, um, you know, I went to church and I knew a lot of the old hymns and, you know, I was using new versions of the Bible and contemporary Christian rock and all this other stuff. And, uh, and I used to think to myself, you know, I have absolutely no connection to the people in this book. They live in a completely different world than I do. I don't, I can't even relate to them. And I was absolutely right because I was lost. I was a false convert, just like a lot of the modern Christians out there right now. They have no ability to relate mentally to the people in this book. This book is just has some nice moral things in it and some stories which we're not sure if they're mythological or not. There might be some different ways to interpret and, and we can just kind of, you know, they don't look and say, oh boy, I can relate so well to Paul and what he went through and because they're lost. It's really something. Um, but one of the things I've learned over the years and here's where a big part of my um, beliefs have changed, so to speak. Um, I was brought up with a teaching of a very simple teaching. The harder you work, the more money you make. Oh, you want this uh, bicycle or you want this thing here or that? Yes, I do, Dad. Okay, then work hard. 
going out here and help me do firewood, go on and do these chores and do that and do this. And the harder you work, the quicker you get that stuff done, the more money you're going to make. We'll give you a better allowance or whatever else. You work hard in school, you get some A's on your report card, you get some money for that. You know, and it was always this thing instilled in me of you know, the capitalistic type of a thing, which is good, of work hard, get paid more money. Okay? Um, and so all through high school, I was working different jobs and things, and I worked hard, and I got better positions at the job where I was working at, the Strasburg Railroad. I went from busing tables to working at the cash register to cooking to cooking on the train. And at the time, I was the only teenager that was doing that, you know, back in the 1990s about 93, 94 in there, 1993, 94. Um, and why? Because I worked hard. And I went from there to a place where I built boats and we started to pick up the pace of how quickly these boats were being made and I got raises and things for that. I worked as a wood turner and there were times when I would actually get a really some really good orders and I worked hard and I made more money. Just seemed like a good... Uh, I don't want to say philosophy, but a good way of thinking. And so I got into ministry and I thought, work hard, make more money. Should work that way. And I started to work hard and I didn't make any money. <laughs> well, okay, I'll make this documentary and I'll put this thing out on DVD and I should be able to, you know, make a decent living from this. I could sell, and, you know, and I'm sitting down and I'm doing the, the calculations in my head. If I can sell this many videos at $20 a piece, and then I have to take about seven or $8 out of that cost for my, you know, time and the, the electric for my computer and the, and the cost of the blank DVD and the ink for the printers and, and the papers and the, the DVD case and then the shrink wrap and the, you know, and I'm going over all this stuff. Plus I have to pay tax on it and and I'm figuring all this stuff up like I've always done. Okay. This is the hard work that I do. This is how many I can get out. I should make at least this much. Didn't happen. Okay. Well, then I started getting into YouTube and all right, then I never didn't want to do the monetization thing. I never have believed in that. And so I should be able to put things out there, put some videos out get more people to come over, buy my DVD or whatever. And I started to make another DVD. I, I made uh, the real Bible. Well, from NIV to KJV was my first one. And then the real Bible version issue exposed and then ridiculous Bible perversions of the new age. And then I redid, I think, I can't think if I redid the, from NIV to KJV, my original video. And then I did the house church uh, uh, series on the whole thing of how to house, how to, start a house church based on the King James Bible. But whatever I did, I was working really hard and I was trying to get material out there and it was just just bombing. And I'm thinking, this doesn't make any sense. I'm producing a good product. People like what I do. And yet, you know, the more preaching type of stuff I do, the people, there's a demand, but there's almost no pay with this. And that's been my struggle ever since then. Um, work hard and there's no pay a lot of times. Um, there's some people that are faithful and wonderful and everything else. Great. Praise the Lord. And that's, that means a lot to me. Um, people have really supported us over the years. That's why I'm still able to do this. But, you know, I saw on Rumble, somebody posted a comment and they said about, you know, if you could get your followers to, you know, donate a dollar, or something like that per video or something like that or you know a month or something you know and again see it gets the old brain going up here and I think what would happen if each one of the people that subscribes to my channel on YouTube just gave me one dollar a month there's just under 48,000 subscribers right now on YouTube and I'm thinking 48,000 times one dollar a month if everybody just sent me one dollar bill in the mail. That'd be $48,000 a month times 12. Okay, over $500,000 a year I would be making and I'm thinking, okay, that would be pretty good. Uh, I'd be able to hire people and actually expand the ministry, but it doesn't happen. And I, you know, and I start thinking about the thing of videos and, you know, I get two, 3,000 views on a video and I'm thinking, okay, if everybody paid a dollar, you know, and, and you start to do the math. 
but that's not how it works. Okay. I have learned both how to be abased, how to abound. I've learned to suffer need and to have my needs met. I'll explain God's system for a preacher here in just a minute. And of course, the opposite of capitalism is what? Communism. Well, I don't believe in communism either. Communism would be, I'd be in some church building someplace and they'd have a little parish that's next door and I get a certain salary and it doesn't really matter if I work hard or not. Um, I get the same pay. So eh, whatever. See, that's not God's system either. God wants there to be a system of motivation there. Um, something that keeps my you know, morale up. Um, makes me feel like actually going out and studying hard and, and whatever else. You know, and of course with me, it, you know, there's sort of the hazardous duty pay, so to speak. I've preached on things that nobody else will preach on because it's career killing and you could get yourself in trouble and your church could be taken away and all this other stuff. I mean, I literally had a pastor tell me that the one time, the way that I speak and everything else. He said, you know, you're this anti-Catholic stuff and whatever else. Uh, I knew a guy that was similar and he lost his church building. <laughs> okay. And why? Did the Catholic Church own it? <laughs> you know, won't get into that. But uh, communism doesn't work. Capitalism doesn't work. Then what is God's system for how a preacher should get paid? Uh, I think it's more of a sort of an allowance type of a thing that a father gives to his son. Uh, let me explain that. Um, God, when, there's, when God calls a man to preach his word, that man is going to have to come to the Lord and say, Okay, Lord, I want to expand the ministry. God, I would actually like to make half a million dollars a year, $500,000 a year. I'd like to have that. God says, Oh, really? Okay, it's a request. Uh, why? Why? Well, Lord, I'd like to expand it. Is that all you're going to do with it? Just expand it? Well, yeah, you know, and then you have to go through the whole process and everything else. Um, that's really how the system works. And I'm coming to realize that and appreciate that and everything else. God has provided for us over the years. Um, but I've been keep going back to that old philosophy, I guess you could say. I didn't want to say that, but, you know, in the beginning there, capitalism is not really, I mean, I guess you could say it's a philosophy, but... The whole point is I keep going back to that in my mind and thinking if I work harder then more people will support the ministry and and that's just not the case. I mean, I've had times where I've worked so hard. I put out, you know, four or five videos just boom 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 like that. Really worked hard putting the time into it and everything else, doing the study and and just you know, nothing. Uh, barely able to pay our bills. There's been other times I put out a video and I think I shouldn't have even put that out. That was awful. I don't know what I was thinking. And somebody writes, you know, us in the mail. And that was just what I needed to hear, brother. And you don't know how that touched me. And I just want to be a blessing to you as you were to me. And um, Lord put, put it on my heart to give you this. And, you know, it's a really good donation or something. And, oh, wow. See, I have no control over the matter. Again, in business, secular business, you look and you say, what does the customer want? Um, what does the customer need? I'll fill that thing for the customer. I can uh, make this or, or do whatever. With ministry, it doesn't work that way. Um, I can't really think about what people want to hear. I have to think about what does God want me to say. Um, there are times that you, I mean, I've said this many times, a lot of my sermons have been the body of Christ just requesting things. Hey, brother, could you speak on this? I've never heard anybody talk about this. What's your opinion on this or that or whatever? But a lot of times it's it's myself and the Lord, things the Lord places on my heart. And um, the pay that comes from that, there are a lot of people out there that they can't pay. And I have to just put it out for free. You say, well, your rewards will be great in heaven. Yeah, well, I get that. But the tricky part about it is that if I was able to reach more people, then I would have better rewards. I'd be able to, you know, get through to a lot more people. I mean, if we had four or five other people working for us here and things, and we were able to expand the ministry and um, have, 
you know, somebody that's be a lot better with video editing than I am, get things out and have a better website and whatever else. You know, I have, the brother contacted me about a website and, I mean, we're so busy right now, I don't even know when I can get back to him. Um, be talking about this actually in a live stream I'll be doing, so this will actually be kind of old news when this sermon comes out, but um, we have all kinds of vehicle trouble right now. I've, I've had three flat tires on our car in the last week insane two of them i've had to fix with you know the, the plugs you can put those things in i've done that myself i've done that for many years um the third problem that we're having is the valve stem is shot so and the tires are just junk i mean they're paper thin made in china i mean taiwan or no thailand excuse me uh thailand's so not china but uh they're junk uh my jeep our jeep cherokee that i've had in other videos and things um, that thing is something's going on with it and the fuel or electrical system or something it's it's all messed up now um, just about left us stranded this morning I limped it back to our property and just two of our main vehicles that we use to go back and forth to work and they're both having problems <laughs> so and people wonder what do you need more than one vehicle just as a small family a husband wife and a you know our son and our dog or something why do you need more than one vehicle uh, because we have vehicle problems and things um, so uh, you know I'm I'm learning I can't keep approaching this ministry with the work harder make more money type of a mindset it's just going, going to have to be the Lord places it on people's hearts to give to this ministry and that's going to be that and I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. That's all I can do. But uh, <clears throat> Romans chapter 1. This uh, verse, we're going through the book of Romans right now. Uh, every night in our family devotions, we read a chapter of Romans and talk about it and things. And um, Romans chapter 1 verse 13. We just read this the other night when we were going through the flat tire issue and in our vehicle or jeep breaking down um because it broke down a couple days ago and then it, it we were able to fix it it started going fine again and then it broke down even worse this morning uh romans 113 now i would not have you ignorant brethren that oftentimes i purposed to come unto you but was let hitherto that i might have some fruit among you also even as among other gentiles um i purpose to do a lot in this ministry but i've been let hitherto uh, there's a lot of times that hindrances come in that i have no control over at all and there's nothing that i can do i can't just say well you know whatever i'm right in the middle of doing a video here or something <sighs> you know and i don't redo my sermons that's the other thing i rarely ever redo a sermon you know you get a lot of these baptist preachers they just they have a sermon they'll preach it 30 or 40 times throughout the years that they're in ministry they just you know they do that and i that's not been my practice Everything I do is a new sermon, you know, two a week on average since, you know, what, 2009 or no, it would be about uh, since 2012, I guess, is when we started to do that. 2012, 2013 is when I was averaging about two a week. But um, there's a lot of hindrance that goes on, a lot of spiritual warfare type of things. Again, YouTube has um, been striking, you know, my channel. And um, as of the making of this video, I am one channel strike away from having my entire channel uh, deleted by YouTube. Whether they'll do it or not, I have no idea. They're making money off of me, so I don't, you know, they have some reason to keep me up. But uh, it really comes down to the fact of if the Lord allows it to happen, then it will happen. If not, then I'll continue. But uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, we'll go back there. I'm going to get into some of the financial stuff here in just a minute that I've learned and why I'm avoiding it right now. Um, I've learned enough about the financial world to realize that there's a lot of pitfalls and traps in it. Um, just to explain, because of our money issues over the years, I've tried to study financial type of things, um, both to save us money, but also to help 
with the money that we do make, what should I be doing with that money investment wise um, to be wise about it and things. We live debt free, so I'm very careful with what we spend. Um, but when you start to study this stuff, it leads to some very serious vexation. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. <laughs> oh boy. Now I'm going to get into some of the secular stuff, and then we'll come back to the financial things here. Um, he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. Well, when you actually start to study the thing of how to make money, how to spend money, how to invest money, whatever else, what is money? There's a good question. Um, when you start to study that stuff, there are some traps and snares, foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. The Bible talks about what we started out in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Um, it's really interesting because I've seen a lot of these guys that are big financial gurus and they're just falling apart in their life. I'll talk about that as we continue over a couple points here I wrote down. Uh, the hurtful lusts of finance. I wrote out nine points. Some things I've learned. You get into this thing of I want to be rich. I want to make money. They fall into many foolish and hurtful lusts when you do that. Number one. It takes about 10 to 30 years of time that you have to wait for the best for your best return on investment. Okay, I'll give you a good example. Stock market crashes in 1929. Uh, people start to realize that they've lost their savings, they've lost their retirement, it leads to a run on the banks. They go into the bank, they say, I want my money. Uh, okay, here's some, but there's people before you. Finally, the bank just says, hey, sorry, we have to close our doors. We're out of money. Sorry. The banks don't have a little box with your name on it and the money that you have, you know, little stacks of cash there in the bank. All right. Um, fractional reserve banking is what the modern banking system is, which means simply that there's just a fraction of your money in the reserves of the bank. Just to boil it down and make it very simple. Um, you make $5,000 or something and you put $5,000 in the bank, there's, it's not there anymore. Okay. It's a number on a computer screen. You say, what do they do with the money? They spend it. They invest it. Every night, they invest the money. And they make sure that they have just a little fraction of that money in the bank in case you come in and say, hey, I need to withdraw some money or something. I need that $5,000 back because I need to buy a car or something like that. Um, they usually will have enough money to give it back. But I've been hearing a lot of stories where they're now saying people are going in for a couple thousand dollars and the banks are saying, we don't have that much. Why? Because the stock market's getting close to crashing again and they're getting close to doing another run on the banks. Um, and you get into the Glass-Steagall Act that was uh, passed after the first Great Depression that required the banks to actually have more money in the bank that they weren't allowed to spend it. It was overthrown in, the, I think, the 1990s, 91 or something like that. And... Um, so now the banks can spend as much money as they want. It's absolutely crazy. Uh, but you had the people in the Great Depression that the guys, the investors and whatever else, and they waited till the stock market crashed. They waited till people ran out of money and then people get into desperate situations and it starts, I have to sell my car to survive. I have to sell my house. I have to sell whatever. And real estate usually is, is the way that you make the best return on investment. It's one of the best most well-known uh, investments out there. But the problem is when the stock market crashed and people lost everything and they finally are selling their houses for next to nothing, you can go out there and you can buy all those houses up if you were a wise investor before, a wise financial guy, and you had plenty of cash outside of the bank system so that it didn't destroy your wealth. You can come out, you know, you could buy, I could buy this whole town when the stock market crashes. But then you have to sit on it until the stock market comes back up again. You buy when in the dip and you sell at the high there. Where it's the bear market is when it's coming down and a bull market it's when it's coming up. And again, these are the things I've learned. I'm 
passing on this wisdom to you so that you don't have to go and waste a lot of time listening to a bunch of lost people. The Bible talks about don't you know that you're not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly, uh, which was what I was doing a lot, and it was quite vexing. And I'm glad I'm, I've taken a, I've definitely stepped back from it. You know, I still look and see, you know, but I don't even bother watching most videos anymore because I know where they're going with different headlines now. I've learned enough about the financial world that I can understand it without having to, you know, waste more of my life looking at all that stuff. So the issue is. If it takes 10 to 30 years to really get a good return on investment, how many of those cycles are you going to be able to go through in your life? I actually heard an older guy, Jeremy Grantham, he's a Wall Street insider guy and whatever else, worked in Wall Street for you know 40 years or something like that. And he was talking about this whole thing of 10 to 30 years. You know, the Great Depression lasted, started in 1929, lasted about 10 years, but it wasn't until the 1950s when the country actually was prosperous again. So if you had bought houses in the crash, you had to wait over 20 years for the economy to come back up high enough where you could have a good return on investment. That's a long time to wait. That's a long time to sit on an investment and just watch it mature and whatever else and try to keep the, the properties up and things. That's a very long time. Um, not good for your nerves, not good for stress. Uh, hurtful lust number two, um, you want to be rich. They that will be rich. Okay, what do you do with your money? Hey, you just, uh, somebody just sends you a check for a million dollars. What do you do with it? Put it in the bank, right? That's where it would be uh, safe. Well, the problem is you, they would spend it first and foremost, but uh, there's also a new thing called bail-ins, banker bail-ins. So if the bank starts to go insolvent, then they will take your money as a way to keep themselves going, financially going. It's called a bail-in. And they can do this, and then they just come to you and say, hey, we had to use up a bunch of your money. Congratulations, you're now part owner of the bank. <laughs> well, I want my money. Well, yeah, I know, but it's we had to use it. So, you know, and you get into the whole thing of it's basically a, they're doing you a favor by keeping your money, you know, in there. So you really should have to pay them. Um, we say, well, then I wouldn't do that. I'd just have to go and put it in the stock market. The stock market can crash, and it will be eventually. Then you lose all your money. Well, I'll put it into precious metals. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. There's issues with that. I'll, okay, I'll just get it in cash and go stick it under my mattress. Yeah, but the problem is every time that they print cash, uh, that cash that you've withdrawn becomes less valuable because of hyperinflation. So what do you do if you're rich and you have just tens of millions of dollars? It's a real problem. That's a uh, foolish and hurtful lust. You see what I'm saying? Number three, the stock market crash wipes out your retirement. A lot of people are going to be learning that very hard lesson soon. Uh, there's a stock market crash that's coming and it's going to wipe out their retirement of a lot of people. A lot of people with their pensions and, and everything else. 401ks, I've been hearing a lot about that, that people are losing tens of thousands of dollars out of their 401ks right now. What's it going to be like when the stock market crashes? Really going to be something. Um, and again, a lot of people, they've just, they destroy themselves with their job so that they can have a really huge retirement someday. A lot of money for retirement. And... You know, instead of just having a, an easier job and working, you know, less hours and whatever else and enjoying life and being in really good shape and just saying, I'm just going to work until I die. If I'm, you know, 90 years old, I'll still be working at some job somewhere, you know, or working for myself. Um, a lot of people will destroy their health so that they can build that wealth for their retirement years, their golden years, as they say. Um, pretty tarnished gold, if you ask me. The fourth hurtful lust of finance is precious metals manipulation. You'll find out about that if you get into finances. You'll start to realize that, uh, that there's ways, basically how it works is supply and demand with the whole thing of precious metals. If there's a lot of silver out there um, in the market, then the prices are down. If there's not much silver, a lot of people start to buy up the silver, then that can drive the price up. There was, I think, the Huntley Brothers or something, 
um, correct me if I'm wrong, put it down in the comments, in the 1980s, and they bought up huge amounts of physical silver in an effort to drive the price up. And they did get it up pretty high. I think it went up to $80 or something like that. Again, I don't remember the exact figures. But uh, it went up pretty high in the 1980s um, because they were trying to drive the price of precious metals up. And they got in trouble with that, or you know, trouble because of that with the government. Um, but I mean, there's stuff coming out, you know, JP Morgan and Jamie Dimon and all these big names and they're all, you know, you know, there's some manipulation going on with the precious metals. Yes. Okay. It's been proven and whatever. We're trying to keep the price of gold down and silver and platinum and palladium and, you know, commodities, you know, that they say that they talk about, uh, and well, there's talk of a new world reserve currency that'll be backed by gold and therefore it will drive the price of gold up. Well, if it does, then they can confiscate the gold, you know. Um, well, there's a, there's a huge need in the green industry, the, the green revolution that's coming with all the solar power and everything else. They're going to need a lot of silver. So that could drive the price of silver up to, you know, $3,000 an ounce or something like this. Okay, and if, they do, if that happens, then the government can come in and take it. You say, well, then you're against precious metals, you know, investment. No, I'm not. It's, you know, what's in the Bible. But what I'm saying is you have to understand they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Thou, O man of God, flee these things. Well, then you shouldn't have money as a man of God. It's not there either. You have to have some money to live in this world. But when you get into the thing of investing and trying to be rich, that's where the problem comes in. Um... Another issue, which you will learn when you get into studying this financial stuff, is this. Health or wealth? Simple life or stressful life? You have to make a choice. There's no way that you can have health and wealth. Period. I don't care. Well, no, I'm a good, I, I'm, I go to the gym, I work out, I have a lot of money and things like this. Um, you know, out there, any of you that are watching me, you know that there's times when you should have been with your wife or you should have been with your children or you've done some things that were not very healthy, a lot of stress, didn't get much sleep and whatever else to build your wealth. I'm not saying that everybody that's wealthy is walking around like a, a corpse or something. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, I'm not saying everybody that has wealth is, is dying of cancer. No, not at all. But what I'm saying is you know if you've pursued wealth, you know that there's been times that you've done some things that were not good for your health so that you could work harder and make some more money. You know I'm speaking the truth. If you're out there and you're some kind of an investor or whatever. Um, number six, another one of the hurtful lusts of finance, uh, marriage and children. I kind of alluded to this in the last point. Um, I've seen a lot of these guys, Robert Kiyosaki, the rich dad, poor dad, author, and whatever else. And um, how's his marriage doing? Oh, that's right. He's divorced. Gerald Salente, Trends Journal. I don't even think he's ever been married. Um, you know, uh, Dan from I Allegedly, he's divorced. Uh, a lot of these guys, not, you know, they're, they're not all divorced. There's some of them that have a wife and children and whatever else. But, you know, again, if you have a wife and children, there's times the child comes along and says, Hey, Dad, I'd like to have this. And you think, you know, I'm trying to save up, you know, to get that investment here. And if I could just get that little bit more money, I could get this thing here and I, we'd be set then and, and whatever. And, uh, you know, let's go to the store and, and, uh, Hey dad, could we get some of this type of food? I haven't had any of that type of thing in, in ages. Um, well, I don't know. Let's just kind of watch what we're spending right now. Let's just be careful. Um, Hey, Dad, can we go out on vacation sometime and, and think, well, yeah, I have to. Wife comes along. She says, hey, are we ever going to go on a date again? Oh, yeah, honey, I, I know. You, you know I love you. I'm trying to provide for you. I mean, that's that's pretty important. Mm -hmm. Number seven, hurtful lusts of finance. Betrayal, jealousy, and greed. Let's take the best businessman. Everything is on the up and up, no dirty underhanded dealings, no tax cheating, no 
you know, anything. The guy's true blue. He's earned it. He's worked hard all of his life. He's the real deal. You're going to have people that will betray you because of your wealth. Again, you know, I'm speaking from knowing a lot of different people out there. Uh, I used to be in the art world. I rubbed shoulders with a lot of the elite people. You know, women in full-length fur coats and the whole deal and everything else. Husbands sent them out there and buy something to make you happy today, dear. And she's trying to decorate their vacation home and whatever else. Uh, you know, you get betrayed. You'll have people that work for you that become jealous. And then they get greedy. That's just the way it is. Um, you get people trying to steal from you. People trying to take advantage of you, lying to you, and hey, I need some help, and whatever else. Yeah, it's a foolish and hurtful lust of being trying to be rich. Another one, another uh, good one here, fraternal connections. You will realize before long, if you're trying to be rich, if you're trying to make a lot of money, that you're going to have to yoke up with some kind of fraternity, some place, the Freemasons or some Catholic knighthood or you know, even college fraternity type of things and whatever else. You need to make the right connections. You need to know the right people. It's all about who you know. Wink, wink, you know. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you come out and you say, you know what, I don't think I can be a Freemason anymore. Oh, well, uh, hey, I I don't know. I I don't know if I can order from you here this week. Uh, I, you know, I, I, some bills came up, okay? I, I have to close my account with you and... Mm -hmm. And pretty soon another Masonic connection drops off and another one and another one and another one. And you aren't making as much money anymore if you try to get out of the fraternity. Um, a lot of preachers that I've known over the years, um, they'll yoke up with uh, big businessmen. The biggest businessmen in the town, they'll try to come along, they'll try to get a hold of that preacher and they'll say, you know, we'll give you some money if you just kind of tone it down a little bit on this and a little on that. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. I've known them. I've actually had the opportunities presented to me. And I've always said no. I've never been monetized here on YouTube. I don't want to yoke up with any fraternal organizations. It's part of the reason I've suffered so much. Because I'm not a Freemason. I'm not a Jesuit. Even though some people try to twist that and put it on me. Which is the height of idiocy. <laughs> But I'm not part of any fraternities at all. That's why I'm standing in a $30,000 piece of junk rundown house. You know, it's better than the place that we had in Bridgewater, which was, you know, 16000 We paid for that. So we've had to, you know, upgrade quite a bit. You know, very expensive ministry that we run here. Uh, you know, uh, this place has, you know, plumbing issues. It has wiring issues. It needs paint. It's, you know, plenty of other things. But, uh, I'm sure I could go a lot more places if I would just yoke up with the uh, right, uh, you know, brethren. Not going to happen. And another hurtful lust of finance, the final one I have listed here is pride. Um, pride is a big problem when it comes to being wealthy. You go someplace and somebody comes up to you and they say, oh, you have that place over there. Uh, have a little problems financially? Um, I'll have you know. Okay, I make this much money a year and I could buy this place if I wanted to. And you know, you start getting that pride thing. If you start to have a lot of money coming in, pretty soon you start to, you know, kind of walk around with your head held up higher and I'm better than everybody else and whatever. They do. That's what happens to rich people. Proverbs chapter 30. And I'm sure that there's more that could be added to that list of hurtful lusts. If you can think of any, write them in the comments section below. I'd love to hear people's thoughts on that. Things that people get messed up on when they get into finance. Um, it can mess you up bad. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 through 9. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be fool and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? 
or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Hmm. How's that a prayer for most people? Well, or I should say, how could that even be a prayer for most people? Maybe say it that way um, today. Most people don't think that way. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Most people I know say I'd rather be rich. You know, I'd, hey, would you deny riches? No, are you kidding me? But you know what? Um, there are some people that have gotten riches. And I think if the question was posed to them later on in life, uh, would you like to give up your riches and live a simple life if you could go back and do it over again? And I think the smart ones, I know the smart ones would say, yes. I wish I could. I wish that, uh, you know, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be full and do not deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Um, there's a lot of different types of wealth out there, brethren, that are not money related. Um, the sound of your children laughing, that's great wealth. Uh, the look of uh, love on your wife's face because you did something really nice for her and you took her for a picnic or you took her for a beautiful hike or something like that. You spent the day with her. You said, what do you want to talk about? Well, yeah, huh? Let's talk for a couple hours all day. That's the kind of wealth that uh, money can't buy. And a lot of these guys, the big shots and things, Robert Kiyosaki, what a miserable individual. I've seen a few of that interviews of that guy, just miserable. <laughs> oh, he can smile and he can laugh and everything else and use all kinds of profanity and whatnot. Um, that guy's had to do so many different things to get to his position of wealth and whatnot. Give you another good one, Donald Trump. What a miserable wretch. A wretched pervert. They're photographed with Epstein and whatever else. Going out there to the pedophile island. Whatever. <laughs> Some of you people voted for the guy and you hope he comes back in and you vote for him again or something. You got problems. But uh, all these different guys doing these things to get rich. How sad. Psalm 62. Psalm 62, verse 8 through 12. Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Not your money. Well, my money is FDIC insured. Well, my retirement is this. Well, I have lots of physical gold and silver. I have great made investments. I have No, God needs to be your refuge. And if you don't have God as your refuge, if you don't know the Lord personally, you're poor. Verse 9. Surely men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. That's a good one. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Trust not in oppression, and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. Hmm. If riches increase. Not laboring to be rich. Not trying they that will be rich. No. If riches increase. If God blesses you with some money. Don't set your heart upon that. Why? Because it can be taken away. And there's not one thing that you can do about it when that happens. Verse 11. God hath spoken once. Twice have I heard this. That power belongeth unto God. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his work. The old saying, you know, you, can, you know what God thinks of money by the kind of people that he gives it to. Well, there's some truth to that. Um, a lot of the wicked people of this world that have lots of this thing called money, which was um, very elusive, uh, paper currency is not money. All right, it's a private Federal Reserve bank it's not federal and they don't have reserves. And they print it up and they can just print as much as they want. Well, eventually that system crashes 
which is where we're heading very soon. Um, you say, what about precious metals? Well, precious metals, they can keep injecting more precious metals into the market through mining and destroying the earth. Uh, and they can keep driving the price down. They can manipulate the market. I mean, there's people that make fake coins, fake precious metals. Uh, it just, so many things are just so crazy with all of this. Uh, the stock market, uh, again, you know, you get into all that stuff. There's manipulation within the stock market and everything else. Um, you say, well, then what's the whole point of life? Oh, um, thou renderest to every man according to his work. What are you doing for God? What are you doing with the Bible? Um, those are the real questions. Well, I'm just going to labor to be rich. I'll, I'll uh, try to get as rich as I can, make as much money as I can so I can give to charities and homeless shelters and things like that. You're not going to impress God with that. Plain and simple. And in you trying to become rich, you're going to pierce yourself through with many sorrows, many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Me just studying economics was uh, starting to get very vexing. Always watching what's going on, what's going on with different markets and things. And, oh, you know, I wonder about this and that. What a bunch of stressful, just terrible stuff. Oh, we can't go anywhere today. We have to work. I have to be here. I have to know what's going on. I have to spend, you know, six hours studying all the, the latest updates with the economy and everything else. How terrible. Finally, let's go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 19 through 21. Lay down up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We all have to make a living. We all have to have bills to pay and things to do and whatever else. And If you're not in ministry, well, it's nice to be able to support ministries and things. We appreciate the ministry or the help that people give us here in the ministry, uh, certainly. Um, but brethren... If you get into this thing of studying financial stuff, and if I've led anybody into that, then I apologize. Um, it's, you know, I studied it. I don't regret some of the study that I did per se. Please understand what I'm saying here. It, you know, I, I'm glad I have the wisdom and the understanding to see the different things, the cycles that the economy goes through and what they're planning to do with the stock market and what's going to happen you know, I've studied some of that stuff with the central bank digital currency that they want to use to bring in the mark of the beast down the road and all of this different stuff. I'm glad that I'm aware of that. But when you start to get into that from the sense of how can I get into this stuff to make good money, um, that's a problem. That's when you start to kind of get into an issue as a preacher. Uh, if you just have a regular secular job or something, well, then certainly be smart about how you invest your money. I'd stay away from the stock market. Um, I could go off on this subject for hours. Uh, but what I've done is I have studied enough to now understand it and say, okay, I need to just walk away from this thing and get back to reading the Word. And I mean, I always was reading the Word, but I'm saying very much more intense, in-depth and as far as the ministry is concerned, um, it's very frustrating. It's a very hard thing to do, you know, to go to work, so to speak, and have no clue if you're going to get paid or not. Um, and, you know, I'm just, I'm the, like a little boy. And I go and I work for my father, and sometimes he decides to pay me, and sometimes he doesn't. <laughs> just simply the way I can put it. And Lord knows what I have need of. And he'll come along and he'll say, okay, I'm going to inspire a bunch of people and to help the ministry out, move the ministry forward, or uh, actually, no, the ministry is not going to go forward, or whatever. Uh, how long should I continue on YouTube? I have no idea. I, I have nothing that I can do there. I'm not going to 
just um, totally censor my speech and and start preaching you know liberal type of stuff so I can impress the YouTube people. Whatever. Um, if the body of Christ is going to pray for the ministry to keep this ministry going, then there's not one thing the devil can do to take it down. If the body of Christ doesn't pray, okay, maybe there's no longer a need for this ministry. Um, so that's going to be it. Just wanted to come out and do this uh, important study. Uh, be very careful, brethren, with this financial stuff. Um, we live in a very sinful, very wicked world. And... Um, trying to make money, trying to make ends meet and everything else. And you can really get drawn into this stuff of the right type of investments and everything. And you're trying to think of, you know, okay, well, the Bible says I'm to lay up for my children. How do I do that? You know, I want to make sure I have enough money. And where do I put it? Where do I invest it? And brethren, you just have to pray, okay? I'm not a financial advisor, praise the Lord. And, uh, but man, you have to pray about this stuff. Because it's very volatile when you actually study this whole financial world and everything else. It's terrible. And you can have all of your money just wiped out like that easily. Um, that's why you have to make the right investments like we just read there in the book of Matthew. Um, lay up your treasures in heaven. All right. So... And a big part of that, brethren, is not just supporting ministries. A big part of it is make sure you spend time with the Lord. Uh, make sure you aren't working so hard that you have no time for Jesus Christ and no time for the family that he's given you if you're married. Okay, it's an important thing. So hopefully I've made sense with this study. It's been uh, a big blessing to me to just finally say, okay, you know what? I need to just step back from this whole thing. I know what's going on. I don't need to know all the latest updates and whatever else. Um, I'll look at it occasionally and, okay, yeah, all right, and that's it. But I'm not going to spend huge amounts of time trying to have all my questions answered and whatever else. So um, please do pray for the ministry. Um, <laughs> what more can I say? I, I don't know what's going to happen with this channel here on YouTube. Um, I'd like to be able to continue. I know YouTube is a cesspool, but you know what? There's a lot of people that come here and they see these videos and it's a blessing to them and they get saved and they get straightened out doctrinally and praise the Lord for that. So uh, I'll continue as long as I can. But uh, please do keep us in your prayers and we'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17-18. through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.